I will call us to order at 703. Um, welcome everyone to the December 7th, 2020 uh, meeting of the Hingham School Committee. Um, I'm gonna call us to order. The meeting is being held remotely as an alternate means of public access pursuant to an order issued by the governor of Massachusetts dated March 12th, 2020, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. You're hereby advised that this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the town of Hingham in accordance with the open meeting law. If any participant wishes to record the meeting, please notify me at the start of the meeting in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 20F, so that I can inform all the other participants of said recording. Uh, I know Harbor Media is recording tonight. Is there anyone else on the call who's recording? If you are, if you could go to the bottom, hit the participants button and use the raise hand function um, at the bottom right. And I'll just give it a minute. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone. Um, so item two is the approval of minutes. 2.1 is the minutes of the Hingham School Committee held on November 12th, 2020, which was the coffee with the superintendent. Uh, would somebody like to make a motion? I'll be glad to make a motion to approve the minutes of the uh, school committee meeting held on November 12th, 2020, the coffee with the president. I'll second. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, and hey, we'll, um, if you are not, if could, if you're not in the school committee, could you please mute yourself right now? Um, okay, so uh, um, the roll call vote: Michelle Ayer, aye. Jen Benham, aye. Ness Carenti, aye. Carlos De Silva, aye. Libby Lewicki, aye. Liza O'Reilly, aye. And I'm an aye as well. Thank you. Uh, number two point two is minutes of the school committee meeting held on November sixteenth, twenty twenty. I move that we approve the minutes of the school committee meeting held on November 16, 2020. Thank you, Carlos. Second. Do we have a second? Second. Thanks, Michelle. Roll call, Michelle. Aye. Jen. Sorry, I, mean, I, I can't hear you, Jen. Aye. Okay, there we go. Um, Ness. Aye. Aye. Carlos. Aye. Libby. Aye. Aye. Liza. Liza. And I'm an I as well. Thank you. Uh, 2.3 is minutes of the school committee meeting held on November 17th, 2020, which was a joint meeting with the selectmen and the advisory committee. I move that we approve the minutes of the school committee meeting held on November 17th, 2020, which was a joint meeting with this above select only in Thank you, Carlos. Two seconds. Second. Thank you. And again, roll call, Michelle. Aye. Jen. Yes. Aye. Carlos. Aye. And Libby. Aye. Liza. Aye. And I'm an I as well. Thank you. And finally, the uh, 2.4, the minutes of the school committee meeting held on November 19th, 2020. I move that we approve the minutes of the school committee meeting held on November 19th, 2020. Second. Second. Thank you. Uh, Michelle? Aye. Jen? Uh, Ness? Aye. Carlos? Aye. Libby? Aye. Isa? Aye. Aye. No, I'm gonna okay. Um, item number three is questions and comments. Uh, the Ham School Committee encourages community engagement and welcomes questions and comments as agenda items are discussed at the meeting. In addition, we have set aside up to 15 minutes at the beginning of this meeting for comments and questions that fall under the purview of the school committee and are not already on tonight's agenda. If any guests wish to speak, uh, please go to the bottom of the screen and tap the participants button and then go to the right bottom right hand and hit the raise, raise hand buttons. Um, when you are recognized by the chair, you can state your name and address and address your co comments to the chairperson. Comments will be limited to, to three minutes per speaker and must relate to topics within the scope of responsibility of the school committee. As established by Massachusetts general law, the responsibilities of the school committee are to one, select and evaluate the superintendent, 
Two, review and approve budgets for public education in the district. And three, establish educational goals and policies for the schools in the district. Speakers are encouraged to present their remarks in a respectful manner and to continue the privacy interests of others. The public comment period is not a time for debate or response to the comments by the school committee. The school committee is not adopting or endorsing any of the comments made during the public comment period. So if anyone has a comment about something that is not on tonight's agenda, again, if you could hit the participants button at the bottom and then the raise hand, which is all the way to the right. And I'll give it a few minutes. Okay, I see Juliet Fulgoni. If you could unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Um, I apologize, it's been a few uh, months since I've actually been able to attend. So if this has been addressed, just feel free to interrupt me. I'm okay with that. Yeah, sorry, Juliet, could you just state your name and address? For I beg your pardon. Yes, <laughs> Juliet Fulgoni, 142 Hersey Street. Thank you. And we're in the Foster District. Good old Achilles heel. Okay, so I know I'm on a time crunch, so I'll try and get to it as quick as possible. I think I'm speaking uh, something that's along the vein of 4.2, which is the increased pay for two learning, but mine is slightly outside of that. And I'm hoping that if you're not um, prepared to speak on it, that at least it's something on your uh, agenda for maybe the next uh, meeting or something like that. Um, I'm actually just, I've been spending some time reading the, uh, at, I believe the latest version of the MOA and I'm looking specifically at 2.15, which is the lunch, if applicable, will be eaten outside. When um, impractical, impractical to do inside, outside, it'll move indoors six feet away. So I'm just, um, I don't know. I'm looking to find out a little bit more, if you can um, speak to, um, I, I guess I'm just having trouble understanding why they can't go full days on the days that they're in. Um, I'm looking at, you know, an, an extra two and a half hours each day that they would have person to person learning um, instead of that hour and a half of pack up and go home and then try to log on. I, I, with the six feet, if they're already six feet away and we're not seeing anything in the near future to move them to three feet or other, um, I'm just thinking that's something that we could start next Monday. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but like, you know, January or something that could be done. And then the specialist, at least for K through five, I know uh, specialists are being done by a Zoom. And I'm just trying to think that couldn't they just do a classroom Zoom with their PE teacher, with their music teacher um, in the same manner that they do at home if they're in there the full day? Um, I know Wednesdays has also been um, something, and again, stop me if, if you're already planning on talking about this, but um, I, I know, again, if I'm going to say I'm at Foster, you're going to say, well, since you're the trouble school, um, you know, has there been any consideration to maybe move some of the admin offices to those um, classrooms that can't be used by students? Um, I know that's a, a big ask, but then perhaps those rooms that are uh, with windows could be used by the students who are special needs that are taking the space um, of the classrooms um, for the other children to maybe alternate A and B alternates for full day Wednesday. So um, thank you, Juliet. And to be clear, there's no trouble school. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Dr. Austin, are you planning to address any of this at the for four point to four point two? Sorry, we can't hear you. Oh. Sorry, he's having some audio issues. Is that something he can mute on a computer and dial in on his cell phone? He might have to do that. We're yeah, I've had to do it for my work too, I understand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> we love technology. I know, exactly. 2020. <laughs> All right, so we'll just give him a minute to call back to to that.
thinking of there's no pressure here, Paul. It's not like you know, a hundred and something people are just anxiously awaiting your answer to this <laughs> to this question. So there's people that are screaming, Juliet, use more of your time since you've been given a granted extension or something. It's <laughs> really more people, plenty of people screaming at me to stop talking. I try to keep it distant. Now, these are good questions, and I know people have been actively working on all of them, <laughs> so, but I don't want to speak out of turn. I was trying to focus on something that didn't require more negotiation because I know that ends up eating up some of your time too. I was trying to focus on the things that didn't need negotiation. We can do, yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Yeah. Paul, if you happen to have a second monitor, try to disconnect that, disconnect that, because that's what I had to do. And I'm still not sure if my uh, audio is good. I see him talking, but it's... This is where having a landline would be helpful, I bet. <laughs> I bet that would work, a rotary phone or something. <laughs> Hello? Can you hear yes, now we can hear you. Great, yeah. You can hear me now? Yes, yeah. I am very, very sorry. I don't know what's happening tonight other than it is 2020 and I just soon get this year away. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, am I going to speak to all of it of why we're not being in on, on full days? I think we've done that multiple times in the past. We, we obviously have um, multiple concerns regarding that, um, regarding administratively that, but I am going to talk a little later about um, the current plans we have to try to increase in-person learning overall. Uh, so I will try to address that uh, a little later in my PowerPoint. Okay, great. Yeah, and Juliet, if you have any questions during at that time, we'll do our best to answer what we can right now. Um, does anyone else have any questions or comments for this period? Okay, seeing none. Um, next, we have item 4.1, is which is or four is the superintendent's report, and 4.1 is the update on COVID-19 metrics and case counts for the district. Dr. Austin. Thank you very much and good evening everyone. I'm so sorry about my technology problems tonight. Um, this is very new. I've never had an issue. So, uh, but then again, we had power surges all weekend. So I guess it's probably uh, par for the course with after Nor'easter. Um, I'm going to ask Julie to please pull up the PowerPoint for me. Or Marianne, whoever's doing that. Thank you. Uh, as always, um, as I start every meeting, um, just to kind of go over the, the public health data that we have right now. Uh, I don't think surprising to anyone, uh, we've had substantial increases in town um, this past week, moving from 16.7 to 24.4 cases per 100,000 in town. We are still in the uh, yellow zone um, where we have the 10 over 10 um, cases per 100,000. Uh, we are still below 5% in identification rate, which keeps us at the yellow. Uh, so right now, so we are continuing yellow. Um, but no doubt that we are increasing the cases in town. So in, uh, like the town, um, we've been keeping metrics now since we started hybrid education. Uh, and the top chart here is the, um, the rolling, um, our weekly total of COVID-19. Uh, and what you would notice from 11, uh, 28 to 12, five is an increase of 10 cases. That represents, folks, a 34% increase in just one week alone uh, of cases. So 10 in one week um, is pretty substantial. Um, and it is a major concern uh, as we move forward that obviously we have um, many students on quarantine, many students and staff both um, actually testing positive. We had 10 this last week. Uh, I will say as of Monday today, I already have four uh, for the week this week. So the numbers are, are not in our favor, uh, and it's something we're, we're watching very closely. Uh, as you can see, the chart on the bottom um, measures the, the weekly cases. This is the greatest uh, weekly increase that we've had all year. 
uh, and includes a uh, over the last six weeks we've been uh, having slight upticks, uh, but certainly this week um, after the uh, Thanksgiving holiday um, we have certainly uh, started to increase. I will tell you this is not what I anticipate uh, as our full increase after the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, as we've heard many uh, speak of from the medical perspective, that we won't see those for another week or so, um, the, the, the impact of the travel. So obviously, um, we're very concerned in town. Um, that we are um, testing positive at such a high rate. Along with our high rate of testing is now going into quarantine. Uh, this week, we have a little more than 80 people on quarantine. Um, and that uh, is including our staff and our, our students at all of our schools. I will say that I've seen uh, over the last trend, uh, beginning on 11-1, was increases to our number of staff that are quarantined. Currently, we have 14 staff that are being quarantined. I will tell you, um, all of us, uh, that uh, our capacity is becoming very thin um, as we uh, have people that are out of our buildings. Um, and first and foremost, it's our job to, to care for those. Uh, that are not well, uh, and I wish them the very best in recovery, um, but we're obviously very concerned uh, about the number of people that are both testing positive and the number of people that are quarantined based on close contacts. So, oops, I think, uh, why don't you go back one, please? Thanks. Um, one of the things that, I don't have a slide on it, um, but everybody knows, I think by now, that Plymouth River um, I made the decision over the weekend to pivot uh, Plymouth River School to uh, remote learning. Um, and I've had a lot of questions as to, well, if there's four cases there and maybe there's four or five or six in another place, why, why Plymouth River? Um, the reality for Plymouth River is that we had our first cluster of the year, and a cluster is defined as uh, two or more people that are testing in the same location. So we're, we're talking about in a grade or a class or a location. Uh, and so we did have a cluster. The idea of going remote during this time was to give us the ability to um, obviously try to uh, contain that, to do our contact tracing. We work uh, collaboratively with the uh, Department of Health in Hingham, the Department of Public Health uh, in the state of Massachusetts and DESE um, to try to contain that and make sure that we've got a handle on that. Um, and right now we're still working through all those uh, contacts. Um, one of the things you'll notice on the quarantine report, we have 32 um, people right now um, or students from PRS on quarantine. So it's a fairly large number. Um, and for those with questions about testing, I have requested from the Department of Public Health in Massachusetts, the Rapid Response Testing Unit. Um, and I am awaiting the um, that, that's not there yet. There you go. Um, and so I'm awaiting the uh, decision of the Department of Public Health to determine whether or not they're going to send that uh, response unit to me. If they do, I anticipate it'll be here Wednesday or Thursday, uh, and it'll probably be very targeted, and we'll let those know what grade or level will be tested um, if they choose to come and who they're going to test. Um, so obviously, we're watching from the river very closely. Um, I did make that a pivot to remote uh, for just Monday and Tuesday. I would anticipate that we could potentially be out uh, at, uh, in remote for the rest of the week. I'm not ready to make that decision today. I just want to give people the heads up. Um, overall, I want to tell people that um, we are really, um, the, the numbers are, are of high concern. Our number one priority, and I have three, I have three priorities. That one is the health and safety of all of our people. Two, is to provide quality education. And three, to do the best we can to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 in our community. Those are our three objectives. Um, when that becomes at risk, um, then we will continue to uh, think about the provision of, of how we're providing education to our students. But I want to give people the, uh, the time and the leeway that I'm very concerned. Um, you should be prepared in the community for anything to, to change um, based upon these numbers. Uh, and so if I believe that that's in the best interest of, of our students and staff in regards to, to health and safety. Uh, and another question that I have often is, how do these decisions get made? Um, first of all, I want to thank 
uh, our nursing staff, uh, Deb Whiting, um, our principals from um, Plymouth River over the weekend. We worked on the weekend. They worked all weekend to contact Trace and to, to work through this um, issue. I want to thank them ahead of time. We also had a meeting this weekend. We talked with the Department of Public Health in Massachusetts, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, as well as the Hingham um, Board, of Edu um, Board of Health. Um, not the Board of Health, but the Health Department, Hingham Health Department. Uh, and so this decision that I made was in consultation with those folks. And although they're not in a position to make recommendations, um, we certainly use them uh, to provide information to me and um, to, to run ideas from. So uh, this is a, uh, an incredibly fluid uh, situation we have right now. Uh, I don't want to put fear in people, but at the same time, we have to be realistic. The fact that we're dealing with a pandemic and that numbers are changing greatly. Uh, and uh, now we'll wait for the next week to see what um, our travel over Thanksgiving and, and is going to do to impact us. So uh, more on that in a little bit. Go ahead and change the slide, Julie. Thank you. So I had some questions on the efforts to increase our K-2 to person in learning. Um, so first, the district has continued to move forward um, with the acquisition uh, and licensing of St. Jerome's in Weymouth. Um, we still haven't uh, signed contract yet, but we're working through that. Um, we are continuing to work on preparing the building and uh, organizing logistics. Um, that is who's going, when they're going, et cetera, which we don't know yet. Um, but we are organizing logistics needed to open it as a satellite HBS school. The school committee is in continued negotiations with the Hingham Education Association to determine the conditions for potential increases to in-person learning. I want to warn people, as I said, given the current metrics and spikes across the Commonwealth, safety concerns continue to be the number one issue, both for the school committee and for the Hingham Education Association. We've now seen evidence for the first time of spread of COVID-19 transmission within at least one of our schools, and that was Plymouth River. The CDC guidance regarding close uh, contacts has changed and is now even more challenging to manage because it requires that you're in six feet or less um, for 15 minutes over a 24 hour period. So if you recall, it used to be, if you're 15 minutes or less at any given time, I mean 15 minutes or more at any given time within six feet, now it's over a 24 hour period. So when you count in mass breaks, transitions, uh, et cetera, bus time, um, this is getting much more difficult to manage and we're certainly feeling that pinch. Um, we must continue to ask the question, if our low transmission is due to the extensive safety protocols and procedures we currently have in place. Yes, we are on a reduced day that's a, at a two thirds day of four hours. Um, and yes, we're maintaining our six feet and we're keeping our, our low numbers. We think we have to ask that question and I think we can equate based upon what we've seen in other places that because of those protocols and our, our very um, cautious approach, we've been able to keep the transmission low um, but as I said tonight, things have changed slightly, um, and now I'm concerned that um, we, we may have, uh, for the first time, seen the transmission within the schools. We have significant concern for increased trans transmission if the district moves to three feet um, between students, um, and that includes lunchtime, et cetera. We would have, we would have some, some significant concern about that as we take off mass, eat lunch, et cetera. We have to ask the question, if this is feasible, given the current rise in cases, both in Hingham, the South Shore, and across the entire state. Um, so we're at a difficult time. We still are moving forward, but we're moving forward very, very cautiously. And finally, we have significant concerns for the increased co cases due to holiday travel and gatherings. I can't say this enough. We'll have to watch the next week uh, as we see what the impact of holiday travel uh, has been on. We, we do have a, a lot of people who did travel um, we have people who have local gatherings, attended gatherings. We're just going to have to wait to see how that plays out um, in, the, in the next few weeks. So those are the what we're trying to do, increasing K2. We're very aware of the time that we want to increase, particularly K1-2, um, and we're still moving in that direction, um, and we're, we're working hard to make them happen, but being cautious. <clears throat> Go ahead and move that, Julie. So with that, I'm going to say we're, we're two weeks away now from our winter break. So I'm going to give some holiday travel reminders. So given the spike in cases just prior to and following the Thanksgiving break, the district is bracing for a substantial uptick uh, in cases over the next two weeks. 
There is a substantial increase in staff and students testing positive, which I've already mentioned is 34% increase just this past week. There's also substantial increases to the number of both students and staff in quarantine due to the close contacts. Please, families, students, staff, follow the guidance and recommendations of the CDC, Department of Public Health, and the Governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Avoid unnecessary travel or other state, to other states considered to be higher risk. And I believe the only one that's not anymore is Hawaii. Um, I, I may be wrong with that one. Avoid spending holiday with members outside of your immediate household. I know that's hard. We're all making that, that, um, that sacrifice right now, um, but it is hard and we'd, uh, we're just gonna have to look forward to another year um, for spending the holidays with members outside of the immediate household. And also avoid inside gatherings of more than 10 people. We need to take this now very seriously this is a, uh, a big threat to the school system and able to continue being able to continue at least hybrid learning and obviously to, to consider more in, in person learning. If you travel, all children above the age of 10, you must present evidence of a negative COVID test 72 hours prior to reentry to the state of Massachusetts or within 72 hours of reentry, um, after reentry, sorry. If you do not test, you must remain in quarantine for, for the CDC and Department of Public Health. This is very important. Please do not um, avoid those rules. Don't send your children to school knowing that we travel. Please, um, we are, you know, we have teachers who are at risk. We have students who are at risk and higher risk. Please do not put us there. Let's follow the, the guidance. Children under the age of 11 must follow what the parent does. This means that if a parent test and is negative, your child under the age of 11 may return to school. If you choose not to test, the child must also do the quarantine as you do. All students must quarantine until test results are available. So please don't send them to school if you're waiting your test result. Please, if you've traveled, follow all of the policies that are listed on our website. We must remain vigilant in order to continue in-person education in Hingham Public Schools. And finally, although not policy, if you have had people travel from a high-risk state and stay with you during in your home, we ask that you please consider testing or quarantine. This is hard on all of us, and we want to stay both safe and remain in school. So thank you for that. The next item I have is an update on the district Wi-Fi. Um, as we know, just a, a week or so ago, um, we had uh, a district Wi-Fi problem that put us in remote learning for two days. Uh, the loss of the Wi-Fi was the result of a faulty controller. Um, that controller has been replaced now. Um, the Wi-Fi is up and running without issues. Uh, and this is a great reminder of how technology needs have changed. And we need to adjust uh, to this, particularly during the, the COVID crisis, but moving forward. We have taken steps to mitigate future disruption. Um, this was a part, from what I understand, does not have a lot of moving parts. You would not expect it would go bad. Um, so it's not like you have, and it's a very expensive part, it's not like you would have one in reserve. Um, and so now that it's been replaced, I don't anticipate any more problems with the Wi-Fi. Um, and I finally want to thank, um, a great big thank you to the Outstanding Technology Department, uh, managed by Joe Andrews and all the work that technology folks do. Um, they work many long hours, get this uh, changed as quickly as possible, as soon as the new part came in and then got us back up and running. So I want to thank them for all they do uh, moving forward. So that's the end of, I think that's the end of my, my PowerPoint. I'm thank sorry you. I had to do that by phone. <laughs> no, whatever you have to do. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. Um, does anyone on the committee have any questions for Dr. Austin? Liza? Yeah, um, thank you, Paul, for that thorough report and your passion too on keeping us all safe. Um, I know we're gonna have Carly Kennedy, our student representative um, to report, but I'd just like to extend of, of our outreach to the community. Um, a couple of years ago, the high school had a public health issue with vaping and the student council worked really closely with putting on a, an assembly and explaining the health issues about vaping. And I just wanted to 
follow up on what Paul said about how we all need to be vigilant and maybe if Carly could take the message back to the student council of encouraging another assembly for high school students and maybe do the same for the middle school of really explaining the challenges we're going through and how we all need to be safe and what young people can do to be safer and explaining what they, you know, they may be healthy through this, they may not be as susceptible, but if they take it home and they have a sibling or a grandparent living with them or they're traveling and how they could be passing it on. Um, if maybe we could get that going, I'd be glad to help you. Um, but also the students are really good at explaining things to their parents and keeping their parents <laughs> in line with what needs to be done. And I think that might help too. Um, but we all have to work really vigilantly at this and with vacation coming up and, you know, more travel and, um, and we want to keep the kids in school too, so that you're not, you know, out even socializing more. That's important too, for us all to stay on task. So just as, as follow up to us all being vigilant, if our students can do it too, um, that would be great. So if Carly can take that message back to the high school. I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Liza. Um, Carly, did you want to speak to that now or do you want to wait until your communications? It's up to you. Um, yeah, I definitely think um, you emailed me earlier about that. And um, I already reached out to some members of the student council. And I think that we're planning on putting together some type of video to um, just kind of educate people and spread awareness. So hopefully that'll be effective and um, we'll promote awareness. Thanks so much, Carly. Yeah, I would think whatever as much as much as much as this could be student led, the, the better, I think. And if you need anything from us, just please let us know. Um, OK, anyone else on the committee have any questions for Dr. Austin? OK, seeing none, I see Hallie Grace has her hand up. If anyone else has anything to ask about his presentation, he covered a lot of ground. Um, you can go click the participants button and then raise hand all the way to the right. So Hallie, if you could just give your name and address for the record. Uh, sure, so I'm Hallie Grace, 20 Franklin Rogers Road. Um, so I just, I guess I'm a little bit confused on the messaging because um, I understand, you know, the four cases that tested positive out of PRS um, over the past two weeks from, you know, pre-Thanksgiving till now. Um, and, you know, Mrs. Smith sent an email last night saying that the spread of the most recent four cases was not as widespread as we anticipated, which is great news. You know, every, all the close contacts have been contacted and notified and most of them have taken tests and most of them have been negative. It seems like most have. So I, I guess I'm just confused on what message we should, you know, what is the truth, I, I guess, is my concern. I, and I'm not saying, you know, everyone should be taking this seriously you know, taking like every precaution possible, but I guess I'm just confused on the messaging of, you know, the spread of four positive cases versus a much larger spread in school. So, I, you know, I don't, I'm, that's my question. Okay, uh, Dr. Austin, did you wanna take that one? Well, I think I'll ask for Melissa's help with that too, because I haven't seen that communication that she made with uh, the students. I will say that um, since yes, they've actually had another um, a positive case at PRS. Um, we are continuing to work through. Um, there are many, if, if you recognize, there are a lot of people who are, you're right, there are people who are testing negative, but there are also people who are co close contact that haven't been tested yet. Uh, and so we're being very cautious. I would also say this is the first time that we have had actual in school transmission. This is the first time when we could go back and say that point A was point B and infected point C over here, that was the first time. And so um, we're working through that with the Department of Public Health, with our, our own health department and um, with, our, um, with our administrators and nurses. Um, but I don't know, Melissa, do you wanna add anything else to your communication? Um, Dr. Eston, I think that you pretty much covered it, but I just wanted to add, um, hi Haley. Um, so we made the determination to go remote for two days. Um, we weren't exactly sure um, how widespread that it was so as we were going through the close contact procedures. Um, we, we were anticipating that it could be up to 60 um, children 
but it ended up only being about the twenties, and there were contacts that were um, double contacts. For example, um, they were connected to both cases, so they only counted as one. Um, so we were happy that it was the number was lower than we had anticipated, and that's what I was trying to say in the memo that I sent out. Yeah, no, I totally understand that, but I guess just the feeling the first 38 minutes of this meeting seems to allude that we're going into a more permanent remote search situation that doesn't necessarily, like, I, yes, I understand that there was this one instance, but it, the tone of the meeting certainly indicates that we're going towards a more permanent remote situation. And so if we're not, if the, if the changing has, or if the thinking has changed, I think, you know, I'd hope that we could understand your thought rationale there. So, Hallie, just a, just a quick, my, my tone is not that we're going to remote and that's it. I'm trying to prepare people in case we have to do that. We have such a high number of staff out right now. We're starting to really have problems with capacity. And so I want to prepare people for that. I, am, I, I want to be really, really very, very clear. I'm doing everything I can to keep us safe and keep us in school. Um, yes, we've been very yes. fortunate that, you know, we have not had to pivot in and out of like many districts have. Uh, and believe me, the decision to do it here was another tough one um, that, you know, took a lot of time on Saturday and for us to really work through this. Um, and so I'm just trying to prepare people that it's very possible so that people, nobody's surprised uh, if we have to do that. But, you know, that's going to be a last case dish, ditch effort we have to, to, to prepare the safety, which I will do in concert with discussions with our own public health, our local public health, with the Massachusetts public health and with Delphi. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Haley, for the question. Uh, next, I see Aaron Elefante. Sorry, you muted, uh, Aaron. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Erin uh, Elefante, 19 Hancock Road. Um, I just have a couple of questions. One is that, you know, I do think that, you know, in the case of PRS, where there's been some in-school transmission, it makes total sense to have a couple of days remote or a week to kind of figure that out and make sure that it's stopping. But I also feel concerns about shutting down everything and kind of scratching these plans for January based on four cases out of what is probably 2000 elementary school students. Um, and I think we know that it is possible for some transmission in schools, but we've seen a lot of data at this point and we have a lot of, you know, we have the governor, we have a lot of infectious disease experts, people at the Harvard School of Public Health, the Chen School of Public Health, who are all saying that it's low risk in schools. And while of course there's always the possibility and you know, we, it seems that we've seen it, it still was, I just think that we need to listen to that and not sort of see the fear of that there was an incident and shut down everything. Um, I just am concerned about that, that we're like looking at that based on, and I understand that cases are rising, but there's data from all over the country and Europe, there's ample data that's showing that school's safer for kids to be in school than out of school. So I just wanted to say that and say that I really hope that you'll continue to try to keep these kids in school. They really need it. And there's been, I'm really seeing the struggle that we're having with that kids not being in school. Thank you, Erin. And, and I'll just reiterate again that, you know, that's why we didn't shut down the whole district. We shut down one school um, while we got a handle on this um, over there and make sure that, um, that it wasn't going to spread any further than what it's doing. So we get control of it. Um, but that said, we still have, we have schools that, that might have more uh, cases in this, but they don't have the spread or the transmission that we have there. We are obviously led by science. We've been talking about science since the very beginning. I will ask the question as we continue, and, and I said that at the beginning, the school committee has been working with me to work with our association on the conditions for bringing students more in person, and we're still working on that uh, as we speak. Um, there's nothing, nothing being scrapped at this point. Um, there's nothing being stopped. We're, we're still moving forward. We're just doing so cautiously, understanding that there are a lot of very, very nervous people around about, you know, as, as reason being. You know, we have people that, you know, we're losing big numbers of students to, to who are going to remote because people and families are very concerned about the level of spread in schools. Um, so we're also seeing that happen. 
Um, and so we're just trying to manage it right now uh, to the best of our ability. We're still moving forward. Uh, and, the, and the objective is to, to stay in school as long as we can uh, and hopefully move forward. I will also say, because um, there was something else that you said about the, you know, the science, you know, and again, it begs the question we have to say, you know, we've heard that there's, you know, the transmission isn't happening in schools. I will say that we've had substantially less cases than many of our um, neighboring districts that have had um, either all day school or lunches, um, some other uh, challenges or that are doing closer um, proximity to students who have seen more numbers. So we have to believe, and I believe that the reason why we've been able to stay in school so far, um, the reason why we've been able to keep moving and not have uh, tremendous disruption is because we are one on a four hour day. Um, we're not doing lunches at school and we're really being very careful with our precautions. So we're gonna take all of that into play as we continue to move forward. So Can thank I you. just ask, I'm sorry, one follow-up question. I don't know if you're allowed to give this information, but when we, I know there were four at PRS. Is it certain that that's spread in school or is it, I'm just curious, like how, you know, that it was not like an out of school situation, maybe a pod or, you know, friends that were out of school. Like, I just am curious, like if it was definitely from in the classroom or how we know that the spread was in the school. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, our contact tracing, I will just say we did our contact tracing, the contact tracing, we were fairly certain where it came from and how it was spread. I mean, is there an exact science to doing that? No, because you're we're relying on people's ability to remember who was I around for that period of time? You know, when was I with that person, et cetera? So there, I don't think there's any way to be 100% sure, but, you know, we were pretty confident what we had and, and where it came from. So thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Um, next is Jamie Pettisano. Yes, thank you. And Dr. Austin, thank you for that update. It was very thorough and very helpful. And uh, Jamie Pedesano, at Independence Lane, by the way. And uh, so, so this may be stating the obvious, but when I see your update, one of the things that jumps out at me, when you highlight the CDC guidance on what constitutes close contact, it seems to me that the move to more students in the classroom and therefore within six feet it seems to me that you could wind up with the requirement for quarantine on a scale, even if there's no in-class transmission, you could wind up with required quarantine that results in less in-school instruction than what we currently have. Would you say that's accurate? I think that's extremely accurate and exactly what we're uh, struggling with. Okay. Thanks, sorry yeah, to state I, the I, obvious, I, I, but... Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely you're right on, Mr. Epizano. And, and, you know, this is one we're struggling with. We do hear this, this is incredibly hard on the parents. It's incredibly hard on the students um, for who are missing in-person instruction. We do understand that. And we're trying to find that balance if there's a way to do this um, reasonably moving forward. And, and that's where the effort has been. And we'll say that the association, you know, they're working with me on that, to try to figure a way to do this that doesn't cause the catastrophic response that you just talked about the real possibility. So thank you. Yeah, I just say from on that point too that a number of other districts um, have had to pivot back and forth um, between remote and in person and hybrid. Um, it's and that's disruptive to kids. This whole thing is disruptive to them, but especially. Um, when they keep, when the schedule changes week to week. So I do appreciate everyone's effort um, being able to keep them in as much as they have been so far and um, and to keep the consistency. And we are, I mean, I, I think I'm speaking for the whole school committee, we are working to get kids in for more time as soon as we possibly can, because we, we definitely, we hear, the, we hear everyone and we know they need it. So I just wanted to say that. I don't see any other hands up. Oh, Kristen Bull. Hi, Kristen Bull for Volunteer Road. Um, I, I guess I just, I understand you're balancing a lot of people and their needs and the physical health of people. But I think something that we're really not looking at is the mental health of our children. And I don't think that you have that black and white data in front of you right now. And that's gonna be retrospective, but it is what every single parent is living right now. Kids that are normal, kids that never had issues are having issues kids that you know needed special education assistance or everybody is having issues and it's stuff that you're not seeing and 
I think that you say, yes, we understand it's hard for them, but you're not living and breathing it every day, watching your healthy kids fall apart in front of you. And it's really sad and upsetting to see. And so I, I know that you're weighing a lot and I know you're so concerned and I know there's a lot of struggles and battles and things that we have to move through, but we're really missing a huge piece of this. And these are our, our children and our babies. They need to be in school more, the little ones especially. And I find it, it's hard to sit here and listen to this presentation. And it's, there's still nothing that you're giving us that's really like black and white that it's gonna actually happen. And I just sit here and I could cry for my kids. And so I just feel like if you could, and I understand that it's very ominous and looming, but if you could just give us a little bit more as to what it could possibly look like and at some certain date, because I'm watching my children fall apart in front of me. Thank you, Kristen. And, you know, first of all, um, and I'm not being defensive about this. I don't want to take this to the indefensive at all. Um, there isn't a day that the administrators and I don't talk about the mental health needs of our students. I'm sure there is not a day that the, the teachers don't don't be uh, or aren't talking about the mental health of students. So I do. We we are taking that into consideration. Now, as far as the black and white, because. Um, I, and I'm hoping that on the 21st, I really am, I'm hoping we got more news because we're continuing to work um, through the association and talking about our black and white plan about how we're going to move forward. Um, we're making progress on that. I do. I'm also cognizant every time I put a number out there, somebody says, okay, that's today and it's going to happen. I just want to tell you we're, we are working very hard on trying to make this happen and trying to find that balance. My heart absolutely goes out to you, and you're right. I don't live in every day. I do watch my grandchildren who are also suffering. I do, and I contact them every day, and I hear it because they're in the same position, just in a different state. So I, my heart goes out to that. I know it's hard. Uh, all I'm doing is my very best to try to figure a way to make this all come forward and or move forward uh, in a very difficult time that, frankly, nobody's got a really good answer to. Um, nobody's been able to find the right balance yet. Um, to make all of this happen. So we're still working at it and we hear you. And Karen, yeah. thank you. And Kristen too, I just want to assure you, and I, I totally do understand. And I know sometimes it can feel like we on the school committee um, don't see it every day, but we do, we also have kids too. So we're seeing it as well. And so I do want to assure you and the community that we do know what you're going through because we are also going through it too. And it is in our minds with every decision that we make and every meeting that we have. And I know it is incredibly frustrating because it feels like the needle is not moving at all. Um, and sometimes it it's feels not. Like we missed our window. I mean, it feels like that these discussions about it should have, been, I mean, we've been talking all about doing all this pivoting. And I think all of us as a community have been very, we've been very flexible and we've, you know, we, we, went with the remote in the beginning we went with this hybrid and we're like waiting because I think we're, we're we're trying to be flexible but it's not it's just like feels like one-sided and I feel like we don't I don't have any control over my children's mental health I don't even care about their education anymore I just care about their mental health you know I mean they don't know how to read and write like basic things that's a bummer but I'm worried about their mental health and and, and I just think we're not we're looking at we're we're looking at a lot of these massive risks of COVID. I know it, I live it in my job, but I, I think we're missing a huge piece of this. And the risk benefit is, it's, it's, it's just, I, I don't know. It's just very disappointing. Uh, and I'm not trying to, I know everybody's working very hard, but we're gonna look in a year and say, oh my gosh, what did we, what happened to these children? That's the, these are my feelings, so. Okay, thank you for that. Um, next, we have student communications. Carly? Hi, everyone. Um, so as I'm sure you all know, um, term one ended last week. So officially, um, a fourth of our school year has been, co has been completed. Um, and then the high school recently decided that we will not be having midterms this year which um, from the student point of view obviously is a blessing because not only will we not have to stress about those, which is any student's dream, but um, also it would have been really difficult to kind of put together all the material that we've learned thus far. 
considering how different this school year has looked and how different our school days are. Um, our fall sports recently terminated their seasons and it was a major accomplishment for these teams to have been able to finish their season safely and successfully. And both girls and boys soccer teams won the Patriot League Cup, which is super exciting. Um, and many of the banquets were still able to be held, whether they were with limited attendance or at outdoor facilities. Um, winter sports will be underway soon, hopefully with the expected date of December 14th. Um, and we hope that they'll have successful seasons as well. And um, hopefully they'll be able to overcome like all the challenges that the winter will bring us because we know how um, important and how sports are such a big part of the high school identity. Um, an honorable mention on the um, topic of sports, two members of our community, um, Helena Orth and Cassandra Dasco recently broke a world record as they took turns rowing for 50 hours straight. Um, the previous world record was 48 hours and together they raised $3,000 for Friends of the Homeless. So that's huge. Um, before Thanksgiving, we had a spirit week, which in normal years that would have included dressing up for theme days at school and attending a pep rally. Um, this year was different, not only because of COVID, but also because of Wi-Fi complications. So both cohorts had to participate in spirit week virtually. Um, but despite that, we still saw a number of students wearing their sports jerseys, their camo and Hingham gear on Zoom, which just goes to show that our spirit um, as a student body is still high. Um, student Council also before Thanksgiving created a video um, in place of our usual all school assembly. So um, we released that to the student body of just updating them on recent events and inserted videos of students talking about what they're thankful for. Um, and it was a great sentiment going into our break and we're hoping to create videos like that more often to enforce a sense of community and also spread awareness. And in this case about um, social distancing and COVID. Um, and then lastly, yesterday, the chorus was able to come together and sing at the um, South Shore Conservatory Amphitheater, and they were able to wear special masks that help with their voice clarity, and they were spaced 12 feet apart. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carly. Does anyone have any questions for Carly? Okay, thanks so much. Um, next is 5.2 communications received by the superintendent. Dr. Austin, do you have anything? Yeah, I don't have anything tonight other than to say congratulations, Carly, and uh, I'm glad that was a great report. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 5.3 is other communications. Does anyone in the committee have anything? Okay, seeing none. Uh, 6.1, we're on unfinished business now to review the proposed fiscal year 22 guiding principles. This is the budget guiding principles. You want me to do that now, Carrie? You're all set. Yep. All right. Thank you. Um, just again, you know, this is the this is the document that um, the school committee approved, and I just want to continue to to remind people what our our primary uh, goals are for this coming year. Um, and so we are hoping that our budget uh, in FY22 uh, will we are presuming a continuation of enrollment from our March 2020 enrollment counts. Our budget will presume a continuation of all the um, full-time equivalents approved in the FY21 budget, which is this current year. All personnel salaries uh, will be sh uh, stepped up according to terms specified in the appropriate collective bargaining agreements. And where the CBAs, the collective bargaining agreements have not been completed as a budget process began, an allowance will be provided for those. So our focus is for the coming year, to provide for expanded um, Hingham's tiered system of support services, the HTSS necessary to remediate the loss of academic progress resulting from COVID-19. It is to fund the process and development of a five-year Hingham Public School strategic plan. It is to provide staffing and support for special education to ensure that the district is able to appropriately and adequately address uh, the needs of all students in the community. It is to fund the resources required for one year uh, of our, I'm sorry, year one in the district equity and inclusion plan. And it's also to provide for legal personnel support the central office administration, which includes the addition of a payroll clerk, an administrative assistant for phone data and analytics, and provide school committee, social media, and communication support. So those are the goals that we have. And I just want to remind folks, and I'll do that monthly as we continue to build the budget. We are about ready to start the process. Actually, we've already started the process and we'll be having meetings in January um, for the public to hear that uh, debate. So thank you. 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Austin. Does anyone on the committee have any questions about that? I'm not seeing anyone. I, I had one actually. Um, when we talk about the Hingham tiered systems of support, um, I know we've talked about academic. Are we building in social emotional support as well? Because I think a lot of students really are feeling this. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, Carrie. And, and it was I was left out because we do have an HTSS um, for social emotional already in place, right. um, and we'll have to, we'll have to look at that to see if we have to make some additions to that. But we also want to make sure that people understood that we were um, moving towards the Hingham tiered support system for academic, which is currently not in place the way that the social emotional is. So yes. Oh Great, thank you. If any members of the public have any questions about the budget um, guiding principles, you can just raise your hand. Okay, I'm not seeing any. So next is 6.2 to hear an update on the fiscal year 21 HPS operating budget. Dr. Austin, do you wanna? Just, yeah, I wanna tell you, sorry, my, I mean, all kinds of computer problems over here. So uh, I just wanna give you an update on the, the operating budget. Um, and again, uh, what most people know that through this year, we agreed to austerity measures um, that would hopefully get us through this uh, difficult year. Um, we are relying heavily on um, the purchase we've made with the, the CARES money that's been available through, um, through the federal government, um, and we're certainly uh, going that direction. I also want to remind people that um, with the with the budget, um, we have had some real difficulty in regards to our I didn't make you aware of, that our fuel bills will be considerably higher this year. Um, than we had anticipated. Um, and we know that one of the ways that we mitigate um, the spread of COVID-19 in the classroom is to open windows. Uh, and as windows are open, we are losing um, heat through those, through those areas. And so we are gonna have some increase uh, in our budget when it comes to the uh, fuel, fuel costs. I just wanna make you aware of that. Great, thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, seeing none, um, number 6.3 is to discuss the expenditure of up to $20,000 from the Hingham High School Fields Project account for the installation of safety nettings on the left side boundary of the Hingham High School varsity softball field and act as appropriate. Yeah, thank you, Carrie. Um, on this one here, um, we've discussed in the past that um, the, the need for the, the safety netting at the girls varsity softball field um, and at this point, um, we were asking for the school committee to allow us to move forward. Um, we have gotten some verbal quotes on that, so we know we can do it for the amount of money that we've suggested tonight, which is um, we're going to ask that you approve an expenditure of up to $20,000. We have verbal um, commitments from people that are, that are telling us that we are able to do it for that amount of money, and so we're going to ask that you uh, approve us to be able to move forward with that. And I would ask John Ferris, do you want anything to that? Uh, yeah, Paul, am, am I coming through? Am I yes? Mm -hmm. am, yeah. Yep. Okay, good. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So the, we got um, quotes for that for between 15 and 17,000. But in this request, I'm actually asking, asking for up to the 20,000 from that Hingham High School Fields Project account. When we did the middle school, we had a quote and at the end, it turned out we needed another section. So it went up a little bit. I think we're going to stay within that 15 to $17,000 range for this one because it's significantly smaller. But it's always good to have a little bit of a buffer in there so that, you know, if you came in at 17.5, you don't have to come back for a vote. Um, with this project under $20,000 in that area, it shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't really have to do a, um, a site plan review. It could fit under the $20,000 mark. So, um, you know, what, what I'm doing here is just saying, you know, if, uh, if to, to get this approval for the money, and then um, Jim Quantimoni, uh, along with the maintenance uh, department, they'll they'll get the um, the vendor in there to do the quotes. So to get the project all organized, and then that way we know we'll be able to get it done before um, softball begins in the springtime. So we got a decent lead time here, and um, you know they'll so they'll solicit like written quotes, pre-written quotes, really for this. But it's certainly going to come in within that range. So that's um, and the um, the uh, the article is actually in the form of uh, a motion that could be made at this committee. So um, desires to approve that. This would be coming out of the Hingham High School Fields Project account. Um, John, can you speak up, please? Am I coming to, it's, 
can other people hear me? Is that any yeah. better? Okay. I think you have to hold your microphone right up there. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Sorry if I did you hear what I was saying? You don't want me to repeat myself, yep. right? OK, um, is the Hingham High School Fields Project account it, based on um, previous expenditures that we made? Uh, there's about fifty seven thousand dollars in there. So, you know, with this 20, there'd still be a thirty seven thousand dollar balance uh, in the account. You may be aware last year we uh, committed about 90,000 for um, other activities at the ball at the um, baseball field and softball field, um, including dugouts and stuff, which will be installed. So all that money sort of encumbered. And um, we put up that new scoreboard over at the softball field, um, you know, for some 17,000. So um, net net, you know, we um, we're, we're coming out at the end of this. There should be somewhere in the range of 37,000. Over the years, the account has been earning um, investment interest as well. So that's where it's sort of tweaked up. So, you know, you can't really nail a figure, but um, it's in that 37 to 40,000 range um, after this expenditure. Great. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions or comments? On the pretty? I'm sorry. I have a question. It's Jen Frizzoli. Okay. So uh, are you sharing slides? I, I'm not seeing any. No. No, okay, so are we talking about next year's budget? No, these, this is an account that was put together when they redid the, um, the fields at the high school and installed the turf field. They, um, the community raised some money and it was put into a fund and hasn't been used yet, but it's set aside for athletic um, field use. Okay. So it's not part of, of, of that. It's, it's like, would you call it a revolving account, John? Yeah. Sorry, we can't oh. hear you. John uh, so it, was, it was a gift account for that purposes, for, for the purposes of the uh, Hingham High School field enhancements or sort of major maintenance efforts. Okay, then I don't know if my question is appropriate for this, but it, it's similar to your your comment earlier, Carrie, around the um, line item for social and emotional programs <laughs> for next year. Um, I, I'm just curious, are we building in a budget to close educational gaps? for our children based on the losses from this year? Yes, that's what the, the Hingham tiered system of supports. Um, that's part of the, um, the guiding principles is, is it's to, it, the one that Dr. Austin highlighted is for academic um, supports because we know kids are losing ground um, since March. And so okay. that's, that's what that should be doing. And then there's also a social emotional one on top of that. Okay, so that's all be, being built into next year's budget. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, regarding the uh, the softball net, um, would somebody like yeah. to question? Do we have discussion or? Yeah, Carlos. Am I uh, okay to go ahead with the motion? Sure. If it, I don't see any of the discussion, so. Okay, I'd like to make a motion to uh, authorize the superintendent, the superintendent to. Um, Spend up to twenty thousand dollars from the high school fields project account for the installation of safety netting on the left side of the field of the Hingham School Vasily softball field. I'll second. Thank you, Ness. All in favor? Um, Michelle. Aye. Jen. Aye. Uh, Ness? Aye. Carlos? Aye. Libby? Aye. Liza? Aye. And I'm an I as well. Thank you. Um, seven is new business. 7.1 to receive the superintendent's proposed goals for 2020-2021 and act appropriate, act as appropriate. This should be 20. Okay, yep. Yeah. All right, yeah. Yeah, thank you, uh, Carrie. Uh, in your packet tonight uh, for the school committee, I have proposed my uh, giving you a copy of my proposed goals. Uh, you had those ahead of time. Um, these are um, fairly straightforward SMART goals uh, in regards to, and a lot of that is, is really a reflection of the report of entry findings that I had um, that I gave to you in, in July of what we found in the district. Um, but overall, basically, um, you know, the first goal, that professional practice goal, I will continue in the new superintendent induction program um, through 2021. Um, the student learning objective is to um, work with the district and building administrators to review, evaluate, and revise 
through appropriating the policies, procedures, and practices in regards to student discipline, the provision of academic supports and interventions for all students. Um, on the on a third goal for district employment uh, improvement, um, we will begin the strategic planning process that we talked about in the overall goal of having a five-year um, strategic plan. So we'll begin that process and um, and get that going. Uh, that's a longer term than just this year goal, um, but certainly my goal this year is to get all those pieces in um, place so we can uh, move forward. Uh, and goal four is to uh, to review the um, data showing that our, our student, uh, African American students and students with disabilities are not enrolled in advanced placement classes, uh, or that's a concern that was raised in the in the community. Um, we're going to address that concern by reviewing this with our administrators uh, and making any adjustments to um, procedures and practices that we feel are important to move forward. So these are all things that came out of our uh, entry findings of the concerns raised by the community. So those are the goals. Thank you for putting that together. Does anyone on the committee have any questions for Dr. Austin or Liza? Yeah, um, I just have a comment on the first goal. If Paul, you could make it specifically saying that it's focused on the instructional core, and you reference that down in the the goal, the third goal for the strategic planning. Um, yeah. Because as I was reading through it, I when I first read goal one, I thought that was the strategic plan. Um, right. So, but that's specific, which I'm glad you're focusing on the. The instructional core, um, but just that distinction would be helpful okay. going forward. Yep. But otherwise, um, they look good and are issues that we clearly have heard about in the community and we know about, and it'd be good to address them. So thank you. Thank you for that. And I just had one question about goal three. Um, you, you noted in there, it's important to note that the scope of this work will span two years. Um, thinking about the next budget cycle, will we have enough of that done as far as the strategic plan to have some really, really solid understanding of what, um, what, what to ask for and what to advocate for in the community? Yeah, we will. That's what I'll be, I'll certainly be working on that the next two months. Yes. Okay, great. Anyone else have any questions? Uh, no, Carrie, I just want to follow up. That's a, that's a good point I think you bring up because I think we all kind of recognize that the next two years, two to five years are going to be a little different, right? Like the next year is sort of going to be about remediating for this year and what we're going to need budgetary wise to remediate the impacts of the COVID and then the strategic plan budgeting priorities of what we're going to need over the next, you know, two to five years after that. So that's a good distinction to make for that goal, I think. Okay, um, and let's see. So I guess I'll take a motion. If anyone wants to make one. I'll make a motion to accept the superintendent's proposed goals for the 2020-2021 school year. Thank you, Liza. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thanks, Michelle. Um, and roll call, Michelle. Aye. Jen. Aye. Ness. Aye. Carlos. Aye. Libby. Aye. Liza. Aye. And I'm an I as well. Thank you. Um, 7.2 is to receive the proposed school committee special reports calendar for 2020 2021. Thank you, Carrie. Once again, uh, this is included in your packet as we uh, continue to move forward, even though this is a uh, certainly a year that's pretty unprecedented with what we're trying to manage. We are still moving forward in several initiatives in the district. Um, so once we see just for the people at home in January, we look at the class of 2020 college board testing and placement report, which will happen in January. Uh, in February, we'll begin to look at the secondary program of studies and the budget FY22 public hearings will take place. Um, and then we'll have a formal budget on the um, vote on what we hope to be on the 22nd of February. Um, that's at least what we're targeting um, for the FY22 budget vote, which is tentative. Uh, in April, we'll begin to uh, review our programs with the math program review uh, slated for April. Um, we'll then in May, uh, in June, look for the council reports from each of the schools. 
those are important as we begin to set goals for the coming year. Um, so we'll have the middle school, the high school, and the first of May. Then we'll have PRS and Foster at the end of May. Uh, and then we'll have the first of June, we'll have East and South uh, reports as we uh, think about the uh, goals that they'll have for the next school year. Uh, and then uh, at the end of the year, you'll end with um, an evaluation at the end of June. Uh, so that's the schedule, and uh, we appreciate um, all the work you guys are doing. I know that's a lot of lot of work for you, and much appreciated. Okay, great, thank you. Um, um, Carrie, one thing: April twenty sixth. That right now, if if we're all healthy and vaccines get out and everything, that would be the first night of town meeting. So. Um, <laughs> Maybe put that as tentative of having, if we're all still in this mode, we'll have the math department review, but um, let's hope it goes the other way and we have to reschedule the math department review. Good point. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Um, 7.3 is to consider a homeschool application for student MQ, grade K, for fiscal year 2021 and ask, act as appropriate. Thank you once again. Um, I'm sorry. I, um, I'm sure I thought I heard some feedback. I'm sorry. Um, as as always, I uh, present these to you and make the recommendation that you uh, that this uh, individual has met the standards for the vision of, uh, of home um, school, and I uh, recommend that you approve. Okay. Somebody like to make a motion? I move that we approve uh, the. Uh, the homeschool application for student MQ, uh, grade K, as recommended by the superintendent for fiscal year 2021. Thanks, do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, we'll call Michelle. Aye. Jen? Aye. Yes? Aye. Carlos? Aye. Libby? Aye. Liza? Aye. And I'm an I as well. Uh, 7.4 is to receive the notification of the appointments of Marianne Gates, ex Executive Assistant to the Superintendent and Recording Secretary to the School Committee, effective November 17, 2020, and Be Benjamin Meal, I hope I said that the right way, as Administrative Assistant to Student Services, also, uh, also effective November 17, 2020. Welcome to you both. Um, 7.5 is to receive notification of the resignation of a paraprofessional Emily Francis, effective November 19th, 2020. Um, thank you for your service to the school. Uh, 7.6 is to discuss a potential option provide for, for, for providing sorry, COVID-19 testing. Dr. Austin? Thank you very much. And to do this, I do have another. I know that people are PowerPointed out, um, but it helps me stay focused on those items that I want to make sure I get to you. Um, so the COVID testing for Hingham Public School staff, um, first of all, we've been looking at this option and we've been exploring options for COVID testing uh, for, for several weeks. I do firmly believe that the way for us to move forward and to get more in-person learning is to better, uh, is that testing has to be a part of that. Um, I believe that that's true. And, and so I think this is important for us uh, to move forward with testing um, as we continue to think about students even, uh, coming back into school. Now, if all works well and we have a vaccine and things stop, then obviously we don't need to test it anymore. But at this point, I think this is absolutely paramount and important. Um, so after consultation with school nurses at the Hingham Health Department, uh, I met with a, a medical logistics company last week to explore the options for testing staff. Um, I will say I also had some help with the Hingham uh, Health Department. Uh, Sue Sarney, Kathy Crowley, uh, thank them very much for their assistance with this, uh, who kind of set me up with this company called CIC Medical. Um, so I am working right now with CIC Medical to move us forward with the testing program through the Broad labor uh, Laboratories in Boston. Uh, if anybody's familiar with Broad, they're one of the most world-renowned uh, labs in the country, uh, or certainly in, in the world, they are very well respected. Uh, and um, we're very excited with the opportunity to do that. I have collaborated with the COVID response team, um, particularly with district administration, the district physician, and our health department, and we will agree the importance of testing to assist us in the mitigation of the spread of COVID-19 in our schools and to, without saying, uh, continue us moving forward into more in-person learning. If we go with this uh, Broad Lab, um, we can uh, test our, our staff on a um, I'm going to propose a weekly schedule um, that we, we put for our staff. 
um, and that any new test would be available. Test results would be a PCR test, by the way. The test results would be made available to us in 24 hours uh, after the test. This plan, what I would suggest is that um, we do a phased in implementation beginning with the elementary staff. We, we simply have to work through our potential logistical issues. Um, and I will say, you know, many times I've heard the community say that if you need our help, we might, you know, you're certainly willing to help. We may need your help with us um, because the logistics of testing um, more than 600 people on a weekly basis um, may be a lot for us and certainly more than our nurses can handle. Um, and so we may need some support with that. Uh, and if we do, I'll make another communication and, and be ready for that. Um, but I would like to phase that in beginning with elementary uh, and then moving to the middle school and high school as quickly as possible. Um, and then moving forward, I would establish a COVID uh, ta uh, testing task force to make the recommendation for how we implement testing. So that's the logistics uh, firm or, or team that I really need to start with logistics. Um, and so um, we can do this um, financially. Um, we all know that there was no budget for testing. Um, who would have predicted a year ago when we built a budget that we would have had to have a testing budget? I will say that the Broad Institute is incredibly um, valuable to us. Um, we can test for somewhere in the neighborhood of about $35 to $40 per person. Um, and I think that that's um, going to cost us somewhere in the neighborhood of about $20. Twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars a week uh, to do testing. Um, I don't know how long that we would need to do testing, um, but it's something that would obviously impact the budget. Uh, as long as there are COVID cares funds to to be able to try to um, try to impact or or to help us with that, we would go after those. Um, but I think this is an absolutely essential um, part of connecting and and uh, our staff to feeling um, safe in our schools. Uh, and to to get good baseline information for us to be able to move forward safely. Um, so that's the proposal I'm making to you tonight. Thank you. I really appreciate. Oh, I think we all do all of the work you put into this um, because we talk about how we can how we can get kids back into school. This is a really major way uh, to make the staff make sure that they're safe and protected and um, get a really good handle on what the spread is or isn't in the school. So I think that's great. Does anyone else on the committee have any questions or comments? I see a hand up. But... Um, I, yeah, I'd just like to add, I know um, Paul's been working on this for a while and has been very passionate about it. And I can reiterate the Broad Institute is the, an excellent resource. My daughter's college has been using it and it's been the 24 hour turnaround on the tests is real. Um, they are world renowned authority. It's best place to go. So I was excited to hear about that. Um, and I think it'll make a big difference for our staff um, and for keeping everybody safe. So thank you for all the efforts. And Kathy Crowley, I see you on the call too. Thank you. Uh, your department has been doing yeoman's work. We really appreciate you heroes for all you've been doing and for helping us as well. So thank you very, very much. Um, so I, I'm very excited about this proposal and fully support it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, I see Mina Laurent has a hand up. Yes. Hi, Carrie. Thank you. Um, Dr. Austin, thank you for sorry. sharing this. Sorry, could you just say your name and address? Oh, sorry. Mina Laurent to Winfield Road. Um, I have a child at South and at Hingham Middle School. Um, thank you for giving me the time just to um, ask a few questions and for the work that you've put into this. So. Um, I'm a cardiac ICU nurse at Boston Children's Hospital. We have not been doing routine testing of staff. So given the low transmission rate within the schools, um, specifically from children to adults, I'm just trying to understand the rationale behind weekly testing. Um, I, I realize that the cost of the test is by far less expensive than what people are paying for asymptomatic testing within the community, but it still seems like quite um, an expense to the public schools at this point. Um, I'm all about getting the kids back in, but I'm just trying to understand the rationale for weekly testing. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. And first and second of all, thank you very much for the work you're doing. Um, I know that on that front line, I really do uh, truly appreciate all the work that you're doing. Uh, I think the reality is that knowing that um, the, the feelings of staff and um, the, the direction of the town wanting to move forward to more in-person learning um, that 
that people would just simply feel a lot more comfortable uh, being tested to know that they're safe uh, and that they are in school and know that um, we're in a situation where there's lots of people on a regular basis uh, and that we're doing everything we can to keep them safe. So um, that was the rationale. Um, the rationale for me really is about moving uh, children to more in person and, and helping uh, staff feel comfortable doing that. Right, and then it'll be, these expenses will be eligible for CARES reimbursement through the end of the year and um, moving forward, assuming that um, the federal government comes through with that funding, correct? Yes. Okay, okay. thank you, Mina. Um, Evan Sheehan? Uh, thanks, Carrie. I'm sorry, my camera's not working tonight. Thanks, Dr. Austin and all of you folks for doing what you're doing. Just a question I had read earlier this week that we are, uh, the town is setting up its own testing site. So are we sharing that with the town or is there a separate one for schools that are going in? And what's the rationale for not combining um, kind of one to handle both schools and the municipal side of the government? Um, I, I can't really speak to the, I know, um, I know Kathy Crowley, you're on the call. If anybody wants to talk about what the, school, the uh, town is doing, but my understanding of the town one, it is a different entity um, where we're providing um, testing to our, our folks free of charge to them uh, and making a very uh, specific contract for that. Uh, in regards to the town, I think it just is an availability to any resident of the town to be tested, um, which would also take insurance premiums, et cetera, or, or insurance, uh, et cetera, to be able to make that happen. But Kathy, can you explain that better than I can, please? No, you did a great job. That's exactly it. it the, the town is giving it as a, a service to encourage testing and to make it more convenient for people. Okay, thank you. Uh, Laura Achatella. Hi, Laura Achatella for Boulder Glen Road. Um, Dr. Austin, this is wonderful news. I just wanted to applaud you for all your efforts. Um, thank you so much for updating the community on this call. I was just curious to know if you could share any details about the timing um, of this implementation. I know you talked about some barriers and the need for a task force, but do you have a general sense of when this will be rolled out? I know you spoke to um, you know, a vaccine and how that could make this less necessary, but I think that's a, a long, long lead time away to everybody. So I'm hoping that this can get up and running and, and, and stay up as running as long as the school needs it. Thank you, Laura. Great question. Yeah, there is a um, about a week and a half lead time um, once we do get our contract signed and um, with our with our company. There's a um, some training that needs to be done with our staff in regards to um, implementing the program, what data we need, et cetera. And so there's some logistics. You know, I mean, I would love to say, and I would say, I'm going to shoot for before the winter break to do at least one round so we can um, begin to feel out what the logistical issues are for us. Um, but safe to say that, you know, if I can't do it then, certainly as soon after the winter break as possible to get that moving. Um, I just believe this is absolutely essential for us to be able to move forward um, with uh, making people feel comfortable about having more students come in. And that's, this is a key to that. So as quickly as I can, but it's going to take us a little bit of time. That's so wonderful. Thank wonderful. you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Laura. Laura, could you say your address? I'm sorry. Sure, it's for Boulder Glen Road. Thank you. All right, Jen? Okay, thank you, Gary. Um, thank you, Dr. Austin. I'm, I'm pleased to see uh, this testing be put, be put into place. I um, said, um, one question, is there, a, once we sign the contract, is there a minimum of tests that we have to commit to? Say our numbers drastically go down and we're not needing um, to do this on a weekly basis, what is, is there a flexibility? There is flexibility. So it's really about how many tests I order. Um, so I could order a few or I can re I can do up to 700 for the entire staff um, or a little more than that for the entire staff. I will say one of the things I neglected to say, one of the reasons why we can get it as such a test um, or reduction in price is because our own school physician, Dr. Stanley, is willing to, to provide a lot of information for us and try to assist in ordering the, the, the test for us. Uh, and we could not do that at the, the uh, this rate without his uh, support. So I, I very much thank him for that. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I see Susie O'Hara. Hi, uh, Susie O'Hara, Seven Wanderers Drive. Um, 
I have a question. Can you just clarify with the testing? Is this for the staff or for the students or both? And then also, is what the, is it? Sorry, what is it? Is there an update about St. Jerome's? I came on the call kind of late, but uh, where does that stand as well? Thanks, Susie. Nice to hear from you tonight. Um, two, two, um, the, the two answers to that really quickly. And I, I'm sorry, I just lost track. I should never respond and say thank you tonight. I'm sorry. Um, so the, the first one is for the staff um, to begin with. I mean, there is a possibility of extending this to um, the students. We will continue to look at that option, um, but first want to get all the staff tested. Um, and so that could be an option at a later date if we need to, um, or if that's uh, prudent for us to, to consider. But right now it's staff. And the second one is St. Jerome's. We are continually moving forward with that. We don't have a signed contract yet, but we're very close to that. Um, and we're working through the licensing requirements. And uh, so I anticipate that we will have that very soon uh, and we continue to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, item eight is subcommittee and project reports. Um, I guess we'll just go in alphabetical order. Um, Michelle, would you like to start? Um, sure. Um, let's see, I'll start with METCO. Um, we had a great coffee a week ago, Dr. Austin and myself, um, NASA were there and Carol's Perez with some of the METCO families. Um, that's sort of a monthly um, coffee with METCO families um, to give them some access to Dr. Austin so they can ask their particular questions um, about some of the challenges they face in particular during this school year. Um, and then last Friday, myself, um, Dr. Austin, Dr. Labillawa, uh, Carol's Perez and Ness and Carrie attended a METCO leadership retreat. Um, it was a four and a half hour Zoom retreat, which seems like that would be very painful, but it was amazing. Um, it was it was really an unbelievably wonderful experience. Uh, the time flew. Um, there were great speakers. Um, Dr. J Jamie and I were actually talking about having um, one of them potentially be a speaker at um, convocation. She was um, so energizing and so inspiring and very real um, talking about um, what we need to be doing to um, promote not just the METCO students and their academic success, but also how to sort of marry the Boston um, Hingham families so that it really is one district and how we can really get more um, out of this program for both sets of families, the Hingham families and Boston families. Um, we watched a movie um, at, to open up the, um, the retreat. Um, it was a history of METCO that the students put together. Um, and it was so amazing that I asked Carrie and she um, generously a, a, a approved that we are going to try to film it. Uh, or sorry, screen it at one of our upcoming um, school committee meetings so that the whole school committee, the administrative team, teachers, the whole community can watch this movie. It's about 25 minutes long, um, but it is really a fascinating reminder of exactly what started METCO, why we have it, um, what our charge is by being a district that provides METCO programming, um, and also how much has changed, but also how little has changed. So um, we're hoping folks will um, be willing to come to the meeting and watch that um, movie. And um, and we'll have some other, I, actually, I'm gonna put together a little memo just to give some highlights of the um, retreat so everybody has that for their files. But it was really, it was a great, um, a great event to put on um, by the team at METCO headquarters. Um, then on special ed subcommittee, um, myself and Jen and Carrie, the subcommittee met with Dr. Dennis last week. We had some um, parents join us as well. And um, Dr. Dennis just gave us an update on staffing for special education. Um, and she was pleased to report that um, for, um, that we had very, that the um, staffing levels were good. We're still short on, um, Power professionals and Dr. Venice, correct me if I'm wrong in any of this, but we're still uh, short on paras. Um, but other faculty positions have been filled, including the speech and language pathologist, which is terrific news. Um, so um, that was a great meeting, and um, I think that's all I have. Okay, hey, thanks, Michelle. Jen, do you have anything? Uh, no, I don't have anything. Okay. Um, Ness, do you have anything? 
Uh, yeah, just an update about uh, a couple things. East, we had our school council meeting. Uh, that was last Wednesday. Uh, we discussed the feedback process for the, the coming year. And given that we can't do in-person focus groups, um, they are going to do surveys again and do Zoom focus groups. Um, HEF also met on the second. Uh, they went through their grants, uh, and this was a meeting that I was not in attendance given they were going through the grant process. Um, but wanted to give an update on that. And um, METCO, I think Michelle gave a great update. Um, I did think. Sorry, I did think I did think of one other thing. If you want to collect your thoughts for a minute on on METCO as well. Um, just to let folks know, the PTOs um, are very um, kindly um, decided this year that they are going to send um, holiday cards to the METCO families, um, just to give them, you know, a little holiday message and thanking them for entrusting them us with their children um, and understanding the long bus rides that they have that are very cold <laughs> on these winter days with the bus windows open. Um, so that was just a nice um, gesture from the PTOs. And then Michelle, did you also want to mention the round table? You know, yes. And I was thinking, I'm like, I feel like I already told folks. Yeah, there were three Metco events. I know they were all right on top of the other. Um, yes, thank you, uh, Ness. I wasn't sure if I had updated the committee on it. Um, but a couple of weeks ago, um, the Carol's Perez and the Hing Immunity Council put together a Metco roundtable, um, which was a roundtable conversation over Zoom um, with. Um, METCO alumni, um, some METCO family members, um, some faculty, and then some um, members of the Hingham Unity Council. And it was just really like an open conversation um, where some of the METCO alumni and current families um, shared their experiences. Um, it was another amazing opportunity. We actually had on the call a METCO alumni who was in the very first graduating class from Hingham High School. He started in METCO in 1968 and um, uh, some really great um, some really great conversations came out of it like what Hingham families could be doing to help support um, METCO families. Um, one of the things that they had talked about were just sort of the basic needs that we forget about because when we've got local students and then children who are students from Boston, just small things like um, like maybe providing a snack for them in the afternoon when they have to stay after school, right? Because they have a bus ride home after, you know, when their, their parents aren't picking them up and they have 10 minutes when they get home and they can quick grab something to eat. But if they're staying after school for a sport or an after school activity, um, maybe providing them with some sort of snack that they can have on the bus. Um, another thought was to not only invite the METCO students to attend school events, but to invite them when we are having community events like Christmas in the Square or um, not, I'm trying to think of uh, other things outside of the school, but like Christmas in the Square was a great example. And then we sort of thought, well, wow, maybe we could provide busing for the kids, um, you know, we have transportation, pick them up in Boston, bring them to Hingham and then bring them back home in the evening so that they can participate more fully in the community as well. Um, and then the last thing was that Joe Collymore had um, pointed out that, you know, the burden cannot be just on the schools to um, do this sort of outreach um, and whatnot. And he talked about um, that years ago when he was uh, um, growing up in, I think he's from Duxbury, mm -hmm. that there was a um, South Shore Citizens Coalition um, of families of color who would get together and socialize and would um, meet up for um, educational pieces. And so he was encouraging people to consider starting something up like that again in the community. So it's a really productive conversation. Great, thank you. Um, Ness, did you have anything else or do you uh, want to talk about yeah, um, Finance, we had a couple warrants, three warrants in your packet. And then on the equity and inclusion task force that I am um, joining Dr. Jamie with, um, I attended two equity inclusion task force meetings on the 18th and on the December 2nd. And then uh, Dr. Jamie presented his foster PTO presentation that I attended as well. And that Great. was it. Thank you. Okay. And do you want to do the warrants now or? 
There was three. Um, I'll pull them up. So I make notes on each of the warrants. Um, the first one is like bus lease, lease equipment. Um, there's some supplies and refunds, books, vans, maintenance, um, uniforms. Second one, um, utilities, mentoring, membership fees, books, tuition and transportation, COVID type expenses, um, repairs and maintenance, scholastic book fees, duct cleaning, uh, van repairs, and diesel. And the last is much of the same, utilities, phone, legal fees, dues, um, subscriptions. So all the notes are in there. Okay, great. Does anyone have any questions on them? Thank you so much. All right, Carlos, do you have anything? Um, capital and facilities. <clears throat> we'll be meeting tomorrow, uh, so we can uh, begin uh, looking through the capital budget. Um, it is open to the public. The meeting, it is at 5 p.m., and it is posted on the town website, if anyone would like to attend. And that's pretty much it. Okay, thank you, Carlos. Uh, Libby? Thank you. So I actually want to start by giving a shout out to the uh, Hingham High School production of the Brothers Grimm Spectaculathon. That was so much fun. They did a really fabulous job. A big bravo. Um, a lot of really creative, um, innovative work went into that production and the, the children really, the students really pulled it off. So thank you. Thank you for bringing some levity to this grim situation that we're all in. Um, and then uh, to, to piggyback on that, I attended a South School Council meeting um, last week with um, Mary Eastwood and um, Mr. B, the gym teacher, and they're both just so um, effusive and inspirational uh, that I uh, had a, a really good uh, fulfilling month just because of those two school-related meetings that are, um, brought some life back into me, I think, because of the wonderful people that are involved in the schools and how they can they can bring it out in a meeting where you know it, and it helps to balance the the gravity of the meetings, the, the school committee meetings that we're all in and sit through and you know just. Uh, have to trudge our way through. Um, so it was really, really nice to be able to see the educators in action and the students in action and, and feel good about that. Um, then also uh, community outreach met last week and we focused on the website and uh, just such a long and arduous process uh, to get it right. Um, so but we went over changes that we want to make and uh, I'm going to meet with Dr. Uh, Jamie Labawa next week and go over the changes so that he can get either uh, administration or uh, Sterling uh, to make those changes for us. And, and then we'll take another look at it and try to fine tune it and then see how we want to be able to continue to update it going forward. Um, and our next community outreach meeting is January 13th at 11 a.m. Great, thank you, Libby. Liza, do you have anything? Yeah, quickly. Um, on November 30th, I attended the middle school school council meeting. And uh, for the salary negotiations, we will cover an executive session. And on the master plan, um, there's been an adjustment to the schedule on Wednesday night, that's December 9th. The consultant is going to present all of the recommendations that the master plan committee voted on and approved to be included in the master plan. So that is an open Zoom meeting. Uh, I encourage people to hear those recommendations and you can send any comments to the planning board because when the master plan committee finishes, it's our recommendation to the planning board. Um, so that is Wednesday night, and then the master plan will meet, a committee will meet again, and a 
final draft recommendation will be made, um, an overall recommendation will be made to the planning board in January. So we've gotten a little delayed, um, but Wednesday night um, should be a more comprehensive, bigger information dump on everyone <laughs> of what we've been working on and what we've been thinking of. So that's that. Great, thank you. Um, I want to reiterate what Libby said and um, compliment the drama club on a great job um, being creative and thinking outside of the box to make the play happen. It was great. Um, the policy subcommittee, we met with our MASD field director last Wednesday to review section G, which is the personnel policies. Um, Dr. Austin has shared those policies with the HEA um, for their feedback and Susan D'Amato is going to take a look at it too. Uh, and we will meet again on the 16th to review their feedback as well as the policy sections H, which is negotiations, and L, which is education agency relations. Um, I at attended the high school PTO meeting last Thursday. It was a really good discussion. Um, I'm really impressed with um, how the P all of the PTOs are pulling their communities together. In a way, it's, it's a, such a strange year and with the hybrid learning and the two cohorts and some people that are fully remote and the kids aren't able to mix as much as usual, they're just doing a fabulous job pulling them together. So uh, thank them for all of their work. Um, Metco, that, as Michelle mentioned last Friday, it was a really very worthwhile presentation. Um, the speaker was fantastic. Um, and I just wanna thank everyone who organized. I want to let you all know that the forecast, the town forecast group is meeting on Thursday, the 10th to start working on, this will be our first discussion about the fiscal year 22 budget. Um, so that will be good. And then I don't know if you saw, um, I emailed everybody, um, Bob Curley from the advisory committee had sent along um, some information about how the town's AAA bond rating is calculated. Um, so I, I emailed it to everyone um, and we can discuss it at a later date if anyone wants to. Um, so next is, uh, sorry, I, I'm, sorry. Michelle? I'm so sorry. I have two other things. I'm sorry. Can you sure go ahead? Go back to the, all right. Sorry. I wanted to remind, um, any folks who are on the call who belong to CPAC that this Thursday is the, um, annual rights and responsibilities presentation. Um, I believe it's at seven o'clock. Um, if you have any questions about it, you could email me and I'll get the information out or check the CPAC page. Um, and then also in other exciting news, um, on Wednesday, December 16th, the MSBA will be voting um, on the moving foster into feasibility time. So it's exciting news, December 16th. So I'll fill everyone in when we hear back from the MSBA. Great, thank you. Um, does anyone else have anything for 48 hours? I'm not seeing anything. Um, so I'll take a uh, motion to adjourn to executive session. I'll make a motion to adjourn to executive session, not to return to open session for the purposes of approving minutes of the executive session held on November 16th, 2020 and discussing strategy related to collective bargaining negotiations with HEA units A, C, D, and the administrators association, the public discussion of which may be detrimental to the committee's bargaining position. I'll second. Thanks, Libby. Okay. Uh, roll call, Michelle. Aye. Jen. Aye. Ness. Aye. Carlos. Aye. Libby. Aye. Liza. Aye. I'm an I as well. Why don't we just take five minutes and then we'll meet up there? <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Thank you, everyone who came tonight. Bye, everyone. Thank you.